What happens when your worst fear becomes your reality? Hi, I'm Brent Cassidy. Welcome to the Nightmare Success In and Out podcast, where we explore how to overcome your fears and nightmares and set yourself free. We're going to be exploring this topic with guys I was in Leavenworth with and others who survived their own nightmare. These stories can be inspiring, sometimes sad. There's some humor, but hopefully you can come away with a nugget of something that'll help you knock down some of the prisons you built up in your own mind. My guest today is Jim Clark from Kansas City. Jim Clark, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here, Brett. <laughs> Had to use the button, though, right? There you go. Perfect. So, Jim, um, it's so cool that we're doing this because you were so essential in my first, I mean, day, hour, when I got to Leavenworth. You know, you're, you're a newbie there and you're, you're looking around. And, and uh, I remember Romo taking me over to you and you were sitting over there in the corner and, and we met and you took me under your wing and um, you know, nobody ever knows how important that is until you're in a situation that I was in, you were in. And um, so I really appreciate you being, being here today and being my guest on this podcast really do. Yeah, he brought you over to meet with some of your people. That's right. That's he right. said I'm he's one people. of you. So help him out. <laughs> So, Jim, you're you're in Kansas City now, but you grew up in St. Louis. You were a St. Right. Louis boy. Uh, take me back. What was teenager Jim Clark doing in the day? Well, as we both went to DeSmet. Uh-huh, who, uh, DeSmet, Spartans. Very, very proud of us. They renamed Jug after you and I. Uh, <laughs> the Jug I'm wall. a South St. Louis kid, yep. second generation. We grew up down by Ted Drews, so... You know, typical, went to Catholic grade school, uh, Jesuit high school. Uh, had a great experience at DeSmet, you know, played basketball and did lots of different things. So, average 1.9 points a game uh, as an unbelievable point guard. You Just really can shoot free throws well. That's right. That's right. So, had a great experience. And, uh, you know, and Brett, we talk a lot about, you know, I was born on third base. You know, I had a mom, a dad, um, I have three brothers and sister, a brother and two sisters. Lived in kind of that South St. Louis. I lived a block from where my mom grew up. My grandpa, my grandparents donated the bells, church bells to St. Gabriel. So it was one of those, that, that environment, that community in St. Louis is stuck in time. I mean, they just had the school picnic this weekend and I saw the pictures that, you know, generations have grown up there. So yeah, that's had a very great cool experience growing up and had a great experience at, you know, in high school and, and all that. So you went to, uh, let's see, you went to Dayton, right? Uh, Bradley University. Bradley, Bradley, yeah, Bradley. Yeah. So I went to, went to college. I, I was going to go to Mizzou, but all my friends that went to Mizzou flunked out. <laughs> it scared me. So I went to Bradley and, and, you know, had a great experience at Bradley. I was treasurer of the student body. I was in a fraternity, left Bradley in, in, in four years, made it out in four and went to work for IBM and, and you know, really had a, very successful college career and also, you know, launched into the business world. So, so tell me a little bit about the IBM experience. Cause you, you kind of took your IBM world and, and launched yourself into your own world. So, yeah, l- so let me know a little about IBM that for 13 years, mostly in Chicago. Uh, I was a marketing rep and a marketing manager and a branch manager. After 13 years, I left IBM to come here to work for Cerner corporation in Kansas city. That was 25 years ago. That's a, it was a software company. It's about, you know, it's a huge company now, but then it was small. They hired five IBM branch managers to divide up the United States. My kids were uh, four, two, and two weeks old when we moved here. Uh, and Kansas City is a great place to raise a family. I did yeah. that for three or four years. Then I went out on my own. I brought three million or eight million of venture capital into a small company. Then I started off on my own and started a healthcare consulting company. We installed software and hospitals around the world got to be 5 million in size. What was the name of that? It was just going great. What was the name of that, Jim? I ran into a wall. So Jim, what was the name of the company you started? Swish holding corporation. Like okay. Swish, like when you and I play basketball, like yeah. every shot. Right. Yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. From the free throw line. Yeah. No, you're a good <laughs> shot. I'll give you credit. 
You're a good shot. You can All play right. basketball. It's hard to say that I know. I know. It's like a vinegar in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so tell me, like, you know, when, when, when you go through the experience that we went through, when was it that you knew things were going the wrong way, that things were bad and things were not feeling right? Yeah. You know, it's the same, the same attitude that you want to start your own business, that same kind of confidence and I can go get them and I'll never give up. You know, that was a Trump book out there. You know, never give up at that yeah. time. It's the same that gives you, that makes you keep digging a hole. So the company we we got to 5 million in revenue it was going well. And then I had a president of the company who was having some problems and, and then the market kind of went down and it, most people that happen on the white collar side, all the stars have got to line up. It was perfect storm was fully overextended, had a line of credit that I falsified financial statements to keep in place. And it was my first company I really owned. It got to 5 million so fast. I never had a confidence problem and way overconfident. Um, it made some just fundamental business mistakes about not diversifying. Uh, and then, you know, things hit and the company went out of business and I was left holding the bag. And at that point, you know, you're, you got a couple million dollars of, of debt and that's over the $1 million IRS threshold. So you're on somebody's target list. Right. And, you know, I just kept digging and digging and digging and digging until it just finally, you know, reached a point where I had to tell my family we lost our home and, you know, went to prison on, you know, August 31st, 2012. So you also, didn't you get into uh, the semi-pro basketball world? Yeah. And I, this was, part of the overconfidence about year three of the company. I, I bought the ABA team. Now spirits of St. Louis used to play in St. Louis. They used to practice at the Smet. So I was a big ABA fan. I was a season ticket holder. Then I bought the team. I ran the league. Uh, great, great ideas. It's just a very tough business model. And it just, it, once again, I think there's a couple things if I wouldn't have done, I probably been okay going, shifting my attention into a second business. Probably not a good idea. Not diversifying the company enough up front, probably not a good idea. And then really the whole idea that, gosh, to get to $5 million wasn't that tough. You know, they say your first two years are your toughest. It wasn't yeah. ours. And I just didn't have the experience level uh, to manage it. It didn't have, wasn't surrounded by advisors. Didn't really know that I needed advisors until it was too late. Yeah. And, uh, and I was, you know, I fully admitted what I did. I made a mistake and falsified financials, which is, when you falsify financial statements to a bank, you break every banking law. Right. Uh, so you're on everybody's radar. And I was a really easy target because I wasn't going anywhere. And I, I was very public. And because I was public, everything got public. Yeah. Because I was in the paper with the basketball team, I became, you know, a success story for the, the U.S. attorney. Right. So, you know, when I guess you've, at some point you realize that you were not going to fight them and go to, to trial. Right. You, you, you wanted to, um, you wanted to admit what you had done and, and, and work out a plea, which is what 97% of the people that get indicted do. Uh, so when you did that, uh, there's, you know, there's a time period that you go through where you, you, you go and you, you admit guilt you have a plea, you've got that time period between that, <laughs> that time and you're waiting basically to be told where you're going. Uh, what was your thoughts when you found out that you got the letter in the mail and where you were going? Well, part of my delay was my father was passing away. So they gave me six months where they just left me alone so I could be with my dad. So my dad never knew what I was facing, which was a blessing. Yeah. Uh, but you know, when they give you the letter I received in June and I was reporting in August and I asked to report August 31st or after, cause I wanted to drop my son off at college. Uh, he was a freshman. So if you think of time, I dropped him off freshman year and I got out and he graduated. So that was the framework. Uh, so I pretty much dedicated myself during that time to have everything ready for my family. So we moved into different house. I sold a lot of possessions it was really just everything was focused on them and, and making it, I, I told myself if I'm in Leavenworth and I know I did everything I could do to make them okay, yeah, I can handle Leavenworth. I didn't read about Leavenworth. 
I didn't talk to anybody about it. I didn't really care. I go, I can handle it as long as I know I don't, I won't look back on June and July and all that period and say, gosh, I wish I would have done something else. Um, so the, the day, I, you know, the day before I reported, my oldest daughter came in and spent the day with me. Uh, I didn't know what I was supposed to, I had a guy drive me up there. Uh, it's, you know, that what, day uh, Jim, me. what, what was your night like before? The night before prison, your sleep, your your thoughts, what was going through your mind? Well, you know, I you like you, Brent. I remember everything vividly. You know, it's like that terrible experience in your life you'll never forget. Yeah. So I remember I didn't even say good night to anybody. I just went in the room and I didn't sleep at all, but I just laid in bed, and I just I just couldn't believe it was happening. Right. I couldn't believe. I had a priest advise me. I go, how do I even get out of the car? Yeah. You know, and, they, and I had my body say, you know, get out the way you came in. And, and I, you know, I just said, I just wanted to get it over. I was so tired. I mean, I can't tell you, and you know, you're just so unbelievably tired of feeling so scared and bad. Yeah. And you're like, I'm going to get in there because that's sooner I get out. And I was, I, I didn't even know what I was walking into and the whole way I walk into is kind of bizarre, but, I was just more like, I want to go to sleep. I'll wake up and, you know, I'm going to get it over. What was the amount of time that you were sentenced? 52 months. And I did 39. Yeah. So you get there the, the day of your, you voluntarily surrender. Right. Um, you have a friend drive you there. I, I mean, your experience was the same as mine. You, you go and you check and stand at that gate knowing that you're, voluntarily surrendering your freedom, uh, walk me inside. Well, this is what was bizarre. I walked up those steps to the, the mat, the medium, and I was in the wrong door. Yeah. And I, I did go, the same thing. Yeah. You, know, you gotta be kidding me. I don't even, you know, so I sit down, you know, they, 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 you don't have anything. I had a wedding ring and then I was married and a pair of glasses and everything else goes away. And I'm sitting and they brought me some Chinese lunch while I'm in a holding cell. And then they interview me, and the first thing the lady tells me is, you know, Michael Vick is no longer here. And I went, you got to be kidding me. I Like, it was just such a bizarre thing. Like, well, can I leave now? I mean. Jim, what was the Michael, deal with the Chinese food? I don't know. That, that, that was the lunch for the day. And I remember <laughs> sitting in there, you know, and nothing really. I think I had a pair. They gave me, a, like, a pair of pants and a shirt just before I got my uniform. And they brought me Chinese food. And I'm going this is just the weirdest thing, you know, you don't, and everything in prison, you know, everything's opposite. You think it's one thing and it's the different. So, you know, they, they give, they go through all, they give you cavity search and all that. But for them to just look at me and say, Michael Vick, I just went, you know, so they, they basically decide to determine that I'm not suicidal. Right. Which is what that intake process is. Well, the other thing that I don't want to, uh, gloss over is you're in the uh, penitentiary. You're not at the camp when you go voluntarily surrender. You know, one of the things that, you know, getting into that holding cell in the basement of that eight built in 1879 prison, um, it's not pretty. And there's a lot of thoughts in my mind is, do they know that I'm not supposed to be here? (laughs) Not this one. Yeah. And you, you, you're held there for a while. I mean, you're probably there for yeah, a few hours. It was, I got, I checked in like 1130 and I didn't get down to the camp until three. Yeah. And that was, I, I just remember sitting there. I mean, I, the whole time I could just feel like I was going to throw up. Yeah. And you know, nothing. One, I think one of the things that you find out, you know, people always say, well, what's prison? Like first thing about prison that you find out immediately is, you know, nothing. They don't tell you anything. They don't want you to know anything. You're going to be told what to do and you go do that. And everything else is your mind racing with what happens next. You know, what, what is the next step? And then somebody opens and slides that big, you know, metal door open and says, come with me. And now you're, now you're heading to the camp. Yeah. The overall feeling is you're just screwed. Yeah. You know, you just feel like this is just going to, it's going to get worse and worse. And I, you know, what's it like to give up your freedom? It's not just your freedom. It's your dignity. It's your rights. Everything you say is quite, everybody thinks you're lying. You're treated like 
like you don't exist and and you get obviously used to that but yeah. when you're sitting there realizing the boy this sure feels like the bottom I mean it yeah felt like that to me so when you you walk in to this rundown looking elementary schoolhouse that you know you're going to be spending <laughs> three or four years in what uh what happens well the whole thing was just bizarre because I get there and it's it's Memorial Day weekend, right? So it's all different. The Friday, the different guard, not all the staff are there. And I'm walking through the door, the, the, all the bunk beds, everything, and everybody's in their bed sleeping. And it's three o'clock in the afternoon and it smelled kind of weird. And there were a lot of activities because it was a holiday week. And it was, I was just like, what the? And they were sold out. So I was on a bunk, on a cot. Cot. And I go, what? You were sold out. <laughs> well, they, well, they said, and I'm sitting there, and this guard walks up to me, one of these, I forget his name, and he goes, new, huh? And I go, well, yeah. And he goes, pinch your skin. I pinched it. And he goes, make it 100 times thicker, and you'll be okay. And I, I just was like, this is just horrible. I mean, I, you just don't know, and you don't know what to do. You're, you're on a cot. You're in the, they give you these khakis. You can't walk in the boots. Yeah. Um, it, it couldn't. It couldn't have been more uncomfortable. Did you have anybody that you ran into within the first few hours that uh, you had started talking to that was going to maybe help you find the next, the next step? Yeah. So there were some of my people. Yep. So Ron Slovacek shows up. Yeah. And he's Catholic, and he came over. He actually gave me a pair of shoes I could walk in. Big deal. And then I'm sitting outside when I get processed and I have a book because I want to look, you know, whatever. Important. And up walks Dusty and Lenny. Um, and, you know, Dusty has no teeth and Lenny, and they're all, they look very odd. They kind of scared me a little bit. And they're two of the nicest guys there. Yeah. Uh, so guys do reach out to you. You know, most of the guys don't want anything to do with you or they're going to try to hustle you. Right. To sell you headphones or, you know, and, I did have a guy, there was a guy that owned an ABA team in Texas. So I'm sitting on the cot. He goes, Hey Jim, how you doing? I go, what? <laughs> he was, I didn't think I knew anybody there. I wasn't really proud. But he goes, Hey, welcome. I go, well, great. You knew somebody. I knew somebody. <laughs> so, you know, going in like, like to an unfamiliar world and you're scared. Uh, you don't want anybody to know you're scared. That's the other weird part of it is, is yeah. that, uh, it's a weird environment because you don't want to, uh, you know, you can't see people cry. You can't see people scared, but you are scared. Uh, what kind of strategies did you use in your mindset of how, how am I going to tackle this, this unfamiliar world? Yeah. So one of the things I thought about going in was it's a whole different world. Okay. So I made a conscious decision to get to know guys that have been down a long time. Okay. And it was uncomfortable at first because they view most white collar guys as rats. We're going to rat them out or we're totally conceited. They were, you know, we think we're superior. We didn't do anything wrong. So I went after, you know, drooping a bunch of the guys that have been down a long time. And I really, and they would just tell me things. I don't know what we could say on air, but they would just, you know, everything's the opposite, you know, so if you've done, there's a saying called uh, lay down and lick your nuts. Yeah. So it's, you know, you've done something wrong. Take it. Mm -hmm. Take it. Don't sit there and complain. You did something to get you here. Take it. And right. so they kind of almost every, almost all you're thinking is wrong. Yeah. Like if there's somebody doing drugs next to you, you can't look at it. Right. Cause it's not your business. You don't need to know about it. Uh, guys cutting in line in front of you during lunch and dinner. Can't say anything. So you really, it takes, you're, you're basically the term I would use, Brett, I was just spinning. Yeah. Spinning yeah. the whole time. And so slowly but surely you get to know some guys that have been there a long time and they start to just teach you how to think and how to process and how to get through the day and the week and the month. You know, Jim, though, I think that is a big tip, uh, not just for prison, but for life. You know, when you're in an unfamiliar environment, seek out people who seem like they're getting it right or that they seem like they're getting along better than others and ask, you know, humble yourself and ask for advice because in an unfamiliar environment, like prison or <laughs> starting a new job, right. uh, 
you know, humbling yourself and asking for advice to be able to get yourself the right information that you need, because in prison, you need the right information because you need to know the prison rules. They give you the handout for the, I mean, I'm, you need to know the inmate rules. They give you the prison rules. What you need to know is the inmate rules. How do I get and survive uh, around with the population that I'm in? How do we get, how do we get from day to day? How do we, and, and there's weird things that go on too. I mean, I'm sure when you saw the people running to uh, lunch or running to dinner, that's a weird phenomenon because actually the food's not that great. (laughs) So you, you know, one thing I noticed about, you know, when I, when I came up on you, it would have been a year later. And one of the things that, you know, I was one of those guys like you, I was trying to find my way, um, and you seemed like you were getting it right. And one of the things that impressed me was, is that you really kind of had a routine of what you were doing. Uh, it was important for you to have a job. Um, and I attached myself to that because that's, you know, like you said, there was a lot of guys there that didn't do that. Right. And I think one of your strategies was, is kind of treat it like you treated your life on the outside on the inside and keep yourself busy, keep you being you. And, and when I met up on you, I mean, I, (laughs) I was shocked that I was meeting somebody that went to my high school and played basketball (laughs) all within an an hour of being in this prison. But you know, the next thing that you did for me was, is you helped me get a job. And so so the term that I use was getting set up. Yeah. And, And that's, that's a very funny term. Cause it happens to you also when you get out mm-hmm. set up is almost everything. It's not only how you think, it's how you live, how you exist, how you do your health. And it took me almost a year to get set up. I'm glad you came after a year <laughs> because <laughs> it was good for me to, cause it's physical. Yeah. It's understanding, you know, guys shining a light in your eyes every two hours. How you yeah, sleep, explain that how you Jim. Do. Don't just gloss over that. What's that? What do you mean when you say that? Well, there's a physical side of prison that's very different. And you, when, I, when you tell people about it, they can't believe it, but you're much more adaptable than you think. What's it like not to really have much heat? Mm-hmm. Well, you adjust. So you wear a coat, so you do different things when you go to sleep. Yep. What about no air conditioning? Yeah. Or what happens when guards come through the night and every two hours you're shining lights in your eyes? Make sure you're there like you're going somewhere. But uh, you're much more adaptable, but you got to let your body get a chance to adapt to it. Um, yeah. And it's true almost everything. The physical side of it is very difficult to get used to. Shower shoes and black mold and mm-hmm. no health and the terrible food. Yeah. But you you got to give yourself time to adjust to it physically. And then there's the emotional side of it. And then there's the idea that says, if I'm going to get through this, I got to play offense. Yep. I got to lean in a little to it. Right. So I, I do this to this day. Every Saturday, I plan my week. So I would go down to the mess hall Saturday mornings by my, my, my I remember you doing book. this yeah my control book yeah <laughs> you know those and I just would manufacture a week yeah I come up with things I want to accomplish so I could feel like I'm checking them off I came up with goals objectives I, I would just because I found it it, it it kept me from spinning it helped slow me down so by the time you got there Brett I had I was in a job that I worked a year to get yep I had gotten the faith stuff going I had I had what was a a new normal life, but I could actually feel like I could calm down a little bit. I wasn't as scared or I didn't find myself the term I use spending as much. Um, And then when you came to me as having someone that it wants to, that I could do this with, because you don't have a lot of people you could talk to in prison, really talk to. The other thing you had is you had a, such a strong support family that I just kind of adopted. They would come and visit you and see all that. And I, it was so healthy for me to see a family support, even though I didn't have that. And for lots of reasons, I didn't have it. I'm not blaming my family, but to see that, it made me feel like, Oh, there's, that's normal. Not what I'm going through. Isn't normal. No, it's interesting. And, and I think that you bring up another good point about you, you did plan your day or you planned your week. Um, you know, what do you think? How did you, because there's hard days in prison. There's sad days in prison. What, what was your 
how did you get yourself in and out of that? Because you can't change it, your environment around you, but you have hard days in prison. You have sad days in prison. What, what, what gets you up and moving out of that? You know, and I don't think you and I have talked about that. We right? haven't. I mean, we talked because it's private, right? So yeah. one of the talents I have now, I never have more than one bad day. So one of the things, there's a guy named Father Al Rockers. He's advised me before I get prison. I go, you know, how do I get through when I'm really down? when I'm really depressed, he goes, let yourself go all the way down. Don't fight it, get depressed and then learn to come back up. So in the days when I would actually feel like I was overwhelmed and it could be a trigger, it could be a, a daughter can't come in to see me or I missed this graduation, whatever. And you get triggered lots of times in prison um, that I would actually go in the shower, cry. Yeah. And I would cry hard. Yeah. And I would let myself have a really bad day. Yeah. But I wouldn't have two. Yeah. And I kind of, I learned for myself now, I let myself, I can get sad and I can flash back and all that, but I don't stay down for very long because I've learned that by just let myself go down there, I feel better when I come back up. When I, when I get it, or the other thing we used to do when go out and walk for an hour and a half, I would do a little test of myself when I'm down. How do I feel before I go outside and work out or walk? And after an hour and a half, how do I feel? Yeah. And I feel better. And I would find those things before and after that I would feel better about. Well, and I, I think, like Jim, that. that's uh, something that we did a lot. We walked uh, a, long, a long ways <laughs> in, a, <laughs> in a small yard. The beautiful barbed wire. Yeah, beautiful barbed wire. The, the sun would hit it at certain times and then as the sun was going down. It would give you different colors. <laughs> but, you know, I always thought, you know, with the talks and the walks that we had – also made you feel more normal. I, I was always looking for things to make me feel like Brent, you know, that I'm, uh, I don't want to get prisonized. I don't want to get institutionalized. So what can I do? You know, my thing was, is, and it's interesting that you say that Jim, you know, going all the way down because I, I wrote in my uh, calendar every day. So if I knew that I had a bad day and I didn't win the day, by doing something that got me to the next day, I knew that was going to just be that day. And I was going to have to do something tomorrow that was going to, when I write this down tomorrow, there's going to be something that's going to be different than the way I'm making myself feel today. And there's, like you said, there are so many triggers, you know, you miss so much, you know, um, you know, I, I, and you miss graduations. I missed a state championship for one of my daughter. Uh, there's so many things that you don't get back and you can't stop feeling bad about that. It's just that you can't stay feeling bad about it because you're in prison and you slide down that slippery slope in prison. And that's a bad place to slide into. Well, you remember there was a joke. How can you tell if you're having a nervous breakdown in prison? How would you know? How would you know? I mean, we talked about that a lot. <laughs> I, I remember the state championship. I remember the phone call going back and forth. I remember having so much fun experiencing that vicariously through yeah. you. There was a little thing that Julie used to do. She would come and visit you, and I'm not stalking you guys, but <laughs> I would look out there, and she would have her finger rolling through the back of your hair. And I used to think that was the neatest thing, <laughs> how neat it would be to have somebody you care about putting a finger in your hair. And that may sound to people on the outside like creepy. That, that, you live for that. Yeah. That is the type of thing you say, wow, I know that's not happening to me, but, man, I, I just think that's so cool that she would do that. Yeah. Well, and, and you miss that too. It's, it's, uh, yeah. prison doesn't give you that. <laughs> I don't think, <laughs> not that I know. Um, maybe from Bubba. Yeah. From Bubba, the big Bubba. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you got me the job at the food warehouse. You, you had actually set up basically my job. And, and, yeah. you know, when I went to clerk there, you had, you had basically created this book that I just had to follow. But I, I always thought that was pretty impressive because there was not a book before Jim Clark got into the food warehouse for a standard operating procedure of how this place operated. I thought that I always thought, wow, I, I walked into this job and somebody, an inmate, Jim Clark put all this together and all I got to do is just follow it. And I'm in prison and nobody asked you to do that. I don't think, did they? No, but, you know, I've been thinking about that since I've been out. Yeah. And I finally understood, somebody was explaining how you build your soul. Mm -hmm. 
And your soul is your mind and your heart. And I think, and that's also with faith. How do you get to faith? Your mind and your heart. But when you work, when you're working on your soul, and really prison breaks you down to your soul, right? What you do, I think, whether it be what you read or what you, how you work, is you have to hit both things. If all you do is 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 all in your heart, you're not in your brain, then all of a sudden you just are so overwhelmed with emotion all the time. Right. If you if you get a chance, even if you're faking the brain stuff, doing things that over the top or I mean, we could talk about how many times I painted our room. Well, I was just going to say that 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 trick you did, but I got to tell you, yeah, and, and, and I know you were busy in your mind because you were just you know a couple of months from being released, but uh, you knew that that worked for you. You knew that uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna paint. And, and by the way, our our cell looked great. By the way, it was fantastic. <laughs> it was very much uh, admired by many Potter other inmates. Bar, I heard. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the Martha Stewart edition. <laughs> <laughs> but but this but the point that about the job and things like that is when I look back and it is true to me now that I understand I'm doing things that intellectually are rewarding, are stimulating my brain, that I'm getting some satisfaction from the work itself. And so I went out of the way to find work that would give me the kind of the satisfaction that whether it be working in the garden and, and the, yeah. the farm and, and doing vegetables, all, that I would get rewarding from the work itself. And that really fed my soul on the hard side, having something, having compassion. The other thing is seeing a whole bunch of guys that weren't born on third base and feeling pretty lucky that I had a great life. And also like, you kind of feel like, what can I do to help? Well, you know, and I want to get into that, Jim, because one of the things that you did in prison, and I bet it hasn't been done since, uh, you got very involved with the Catholic ministry there. Uh, and can you explain to me, because what you did and how you did that, I'm not sure if it ever happened or will ever happen again, but can you explain how that happened? Because uh, you brought a very important person into that world for these men. I'd just like for you to share how that worked in your brain and you put right. it into action. So there was a group, I was at a Catholic parish called Nativity Parish in Leewood, Kansas. And there was a men's group that I was part of. And before I went to prison, they prayed on, they put their hands on me and prayed on me and said, whatever you need when you go there, we're there for you. Well, I had one of the priests there, Father Al, I asked, how do I get deeper by faith? And he said, you work on it every day. And it was something you do. It's not something you just read about. So I got to Leavenworth and they didn't have mass coming in on Sundays. And because I was in, basically 45 minutes from Leavenworth, I had people that I could help do things with. So they sent videos and, and things, but I was able to get Father Schieber from St. Michael's up, who was a vicar general who's in charge of placing all priests. So we began to, but we lucked out. We found a guy named Archbishop Kelleher, who was a retired archbishop that was going up to Leavenworth, the big house, that we were able to, for my connections at the parish, have him come over to Leavenworth. And he was at the age where it was kind of harder and harder for him to go into the, the medium. So he really started to come into the camp with us. And then we built the Catholic parish pseudo camp called Maximilian Colby after the, uh, the patron saint, the priest that died at Auschwitz. We had a, what's called an RCIA program where we had about 17 guys convert to being Catholic, but wasn't, it wasn't really a Catholic thing. It was a Christian thing. We had a, it was a Catholic mass once a week. And then we had a Protestant choir singing Ave Maria. If you know anything about Protestants, that's kind of a funny thing. It is um, funny. <laughs> but the, the guys would go to mass would be just trying to get through the week. So we learned a lot. I, so I got a chance. I didn't have a lot of family visits. So I, and Brett, we don't know this. I would dress in my the clean uniform stuff on Sunday. And I would stand out there waiting for the priest to come in. And guys would say, hey, have you having a visit? I said, no, I'm visiting baby Jesus. That's that true. was kind of my That was thing. your thing. But we had 380 guys went through it over three and a half years. We did a feast of our lady Guadalupe and all that, but it was extremely rewarding because it wasn't about me. Yeah. I found one of the things that fed my soul wasn't to be so narcissistic or so much into me. And so the faith stuff allowed me to kind of open up and get to know other guys personally. And we had guys, I mean, there was one guy named Teddy who had AIDS and cancer and he was right across from us, Brent. And I went into Archbishop Kelleher. I said, I don't know what this guy's faith is, but he's dying. And Archbishop Kelleher said, I need to see him right now. 
we held up mass for a half hour, 50 guys out there watching. And two weeks later, that guy dies. Yeah. Uh, and the guys could see really when you have a priest walking through hell, that's what it's like in Leavenworth. A priest was walking in. Yeah. It doesn't matter what denomination, what just a pure man of God. And you just wish all the priests could see what rock stars they are. And you really see that in prison. It meant a lot to a lot of people that that actually happened, that, a, that an archbishop uh, would come to the place that we lived and, and uh, was not afraid to be there, became part of it. And I think the guys, for those who didn't have anything, uh, it gave them something, and it was a big deal. Well, Romo, your guy, yeah. met when you were in first boy, he was a shock collar. Mm-hmm. He so there was one time where the Mexican Hispanic Mexican gangs were fighting and one of the groups didn't come. And Keller said, Where's he went to Romo? He goes, Where's the other group? He goes, Well, we're fighting. He goes, I need to see both you shock collars right now. Nobody messed with the archbishop. And no. the other thing is he would bless rosaries. So one of the things Brett you know saw there was a huge rosary making business. Right. There's a lot of hustle in prison. A lot of hustle. But but there was he come to mass and there'd be 10 rosaries to bless every week. And he, he goes, Jim, he goes, how many rosaries do these guys need? <laughs> we go, no, no, no. Archbishop, they're sending them home to their family. Yeah. And then I would walk out with the archbishop when he left and he would say hi to family. So imagine you're in the visiting center and you're the dad and you've committed a crime and, and you, and you're there with your family and up walks the archbishop. Yeah. And the archbishop says, Hey, you're, I mean, this is very emotional. Hey, your dad's doing the right thing. Yeah. What that does to that family, it's it's dramatic. So then, because some guys got jealous of it, they complained that the archbishop was talking to guys not to their family. Yeah. So then I became his bodyguard, which was just funny. But um, you did. But you know, those are the, the prison faith is another. There was a guy that ran the Protestant group. He had a naked woman on one shoulder and Jesus Christ on the other. And I used to always say to the archbishop, I go, why you know why can't that guy just put a bikini on her? And he goes, Jim, that's probably the most honest guy here. Yeah, so. probably true. So, so tell me a little bit about um, TV and movie night. <laughs> <laughs> well, after I beat you playing basketball, right. that's yeah. what I remember. Yeah, um, that's a good memory. So it was. A, it's a weird thing, you know. They have movie in the gym, six hundred guys or whatever. Uh huh. Of course, it's R-rated movies. Why? Because they can bootleg them. Why? Because they're criminals. They like to do that. And there's first all run sorts of good stuff and questionable stuff, you know, made in microwaves of cheesecake and different things. One of my memories was I'm sitting there and they got an R rated movie and up comes a naked woman. And I'm going, oh, okay, great. Nobody says anything. And then about a half hour later, a guy's doing meth. The place goes crazy. And that was the first time I really started to understand addiction. Yeah. I mean, the fact that these guys, they would talk about that all week. And they would tell their stories and they would like to tell, especially guys like me that never did a lot of drugs. They would love to embarrass me and yeah. tell me stuff to freak me out, you know, and, but the draw of that and actually seeing the visceral reaction to somebody doing meth, if you were into meth or cocaine and how it was just, just so impacted the guys. I was like, wow. Yeah. And, and uh, you're, you're right about that. that. That did create quite a reaction. So, you um, tell me a little bit about getting close to the close to the door, because there's a lot. I think there's a lot of things that go on in, in a guy's mind that they don't really talk about. I think there's a couple of things reason why you don't talk about it. You don't want people to feel like uh, they know you're close to the door, and you don't really want to talk a lot about it because there's some kind of weird dynamic there that they aren't close to the door, and you are. So you you deal with a lot of that internally. I mean, you and I talked about it, but yeah. tell me about what was going on in your mind because as you get closer to the door, you start thinking more about the outside world. All right, and they let you go on a furlough weekend, which I did, which was exciting where you you know, you get in front of a television and click the clicker finally after three and a half years of not having a remote or get online. So me, for me, I think most of the time you get really annoyed by guys leaving and, and making a big deal out of it for themselves. I mean, there are guys, you know, that were just, walk around, I'm getting out, you know, you just want to, you just want to taser them if you had a taser. Uh, so, and it's very fragile because some guys are very, you know, obviously very jealous of it. Um, and other guys make such a huge deal out of it and get all these clothes in. And I mean, you know, so for me, I was, I was just so excited 
I mean, this is the benefit of losing your freedom. When you get it back, you'll never take it for granted. So I know that the halfway house I went to, like you did, Brett, was yeah. almost worse than prison in so many ways. Yeah. But, 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 but I'm not there. Yeah. And, you know, that still is with me. You know, even having a bad day or with COVID, you know, I heard all these people talk about freedom. Uh-uh. I, I'm still happy. I'm not there. Even my worst day here. Yeah. I'm not there. No. And that having that attitude, because attitude's everything. Yeah. Um, is so, so, you know, you get out and, you know, I have my buddies. I, once again, my family was around me. So I guys pick me up and drive me over the halfway house. And, and then I was able to walk in a, I think it was a Walmart or something. I was in Leavenworth still. Yeah. I left the prison to go to a Leavenworth halfway house, which is totally screwed up. Really strange. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I went to I went to a subway one time when I was still in the halfway house and I see one of the guards and he buys me a sandwich. That was just <laughs> wow. Yeah. So but anyway, uh, the thing about when you get out is you start to begin to realize how you've been out of circulation for so long. I mean, and it's just not the cell phones, it's the speed, it's the lights, it's the big store. You know, you go through three and a half years of, of groveling for a commissary to get you know, something, and then you walk in Walmart, you're like, wow. I remember the fast, I remember the first Christmas I got in November, I, in December, I walked through Ikea. And I was just, I, I looked like a kid at Disney World. I was mm -hmm. just almost drooling. It's so exciting. And you know what? I'm still like that. I want that excitement. I, I want to make sure I never lose that sense of, it's great to be free. Yeah. Um, but the reality of it is, your path, your first six months, are as difficult getting out as the first six months in prison by every way. What they, the ankle monitor, the stress, the, I mean, you have no rights, you screw up, you're going back. Um, but it's not prison. So, but it's pretty tough. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point there. You, when you get out, you're not in prison but you still have all the things surrounding you and your mind of being in prison. And like you said, if you mess up, uh, that whole idea of going back is, is it will keep you up at night. And that's, uh, you know, like you said, getting set up in prison, you have to get set up back in real life because strangely enough, you know, when you go into prison, it's like the clock stops, yeah, literally stops. And then you are basically thrown back into society, like just boom, you're in. And you're catching back up to that time period that stopped for you. And you're trying also to be very normal when you're not feeling normal. Because that's the weird part of it is, is that you, you are excited. I mean, you can't take that away from being out of prison that you're excited about it. But you're not quite normal yet. That's what's strange is that you're not quite normal yet. And it takes you six months to a year, I think, to start feeling like, okay, I'm here. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's a function of what you're going out to. I mean, I, I think, Brent, I think I've only recently begun to feel normal. And I've been out five years. Yeah. So if I went back out and I was around my family and we lived together and all that, I think normal would happen much easier. But, you know, 80% of the guys have been down for more than two years you get divorced. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not only not normal, you're now having to, you're not raising kids. You, it's a whole different thing. So, you know, the, the thing that it's the transit, you know, getting set up again and the way, you know, you're through the setup process is you're not spending as much and you're actually starting to feel like you, you're not looking over your shoulder. You know, if you're driving a car, you get pulled over by a cop. I was in a car accident. Somebody hit me from behind and I was on still under the halfway house six months. He called me over, read me the ride act. I did nothing. Right. And boy, that flashes you back to prison so fast. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the, PTSD that, that, is yeah, what that yeah. is. And, and I, I think many people go through stuff. I mean, I, yeah. you know, one of the things that we encounter is that people know you into prison, you hear their story. Yeah. You know, kids commit suicide or this happened, this happened. I get all that. But the physical, the, the soul part of you, when you leave prison, you're coming out with your soul. Your soul has got to adapt again. And yeah. it's everything. It's just not one thing. You know, your ability to have a normal conversation, you know, with someone of the opposite sex. When I've been around women for three and a half years, really. Right. It's just different. It's just, 
and you kind of forget how to be how to be you and who you is and who you is. I'm sure that's that's good. I like that. Yeah, I like who you is. But uh, so I think there's a lot to be said about it. And, and I dealt one of the things I did. I did a bunch of reentry work for the first couple of years out in different things. And you know, you just see guys coming out all the time. You go, man. I'll see you in six months because it's going to take you a while just to calm down. Well, and, and as you know, and I know the, the recidivism rate is so disturbing because you have two thirds that go back and three years and three fourths that go back in five years. And the reason for a lot of that is, is that, and some of the things you're talking about getting set up, you need a job, you need a place to live and you need credit for, or a car. And all three of those things uh, they can discriminate against you and not give that to you because you're an ex felon. And so it makes it really, really hard unless you've got somebody that wants to believe in you, give you an opportunity, somebody you have a relationship that knows you, uh, man, it's tough. That's a tough interview. Well, you put, put drugs on top of it, put drugs you're on top. You're an addict. Yeah. You know, the whole saying of, I looked in the mirror and I'm the enemy. Right. I mean, you know, you and I always look over our shoulder who's coming at us. Right. Imagine if you're looking over your shoulder and who's coming at you is you. Yeah. I mean, it, it is very different. I mean, I, I can't, I don't think we could overstate how difficult it is for guys. Uh, and I, you know, I went to prison when I'm in my fifties, it's a little yeah. different, but you know, you deal with guys coming in in their twenties and thirties and don't have a career, don't have a job, don't have a set of skills. And, right. You know, this, what they've gone to prison for isn't the worst thing they've done. Well, you looking know, at, looking at where you're at now, what is, what is, what's the most, what do you appreciate the most about being out? I, I am not the same person. Um, and I'm still not over the, how do I, I could I forgive myself to what I did to my family and the hurt I caused. I'm still not there. I'm far better along on that, but I'm just not the same person that made those mistakes. And I'm very thankful that I'm not now. I would never want to go through this, but I am stronger. Yep. I am smarter. Yep. I am humbler. Yep. That's a word. Yeah. I connect with people directly. I don't, I have a zero bullshit meter with people. I don't really, I'm not superficial. Right. Uh, I like to have meaningful conversations. I don't get distracted by Donald Trump or any of this stuff. I don't, I have a chip on my shoulder, which is, I want to have a great life yep. and I'm not going to be denied. Yep. And that's one of the things coming through prison. If you get through it, it didn't win. Right. You feel a win. sense of accomplishment that you survived that and, and you got out. Isn't that weird though? I mean, if you try to tell people, I feel proud that I got through it. Yeah. They'll be like proud of being in prison. Really? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, did you find it hard to blend back in to society well what i did and i'm not sure i would do this again okay in retrospect i went back to my old neighborhood went back to my old parish yeah so i did a presentation with archbishop kelleher and we walked guys into prison with it was a catholic business network we had 200 guys in the room and he walked he basically went through what's it like to say mass in prison and i walked this was my parish for 25 years yeah i walked all the guys into prison and go through the experience of what's it like to get out and then I had Catholic charities do a piece. And I wanted to kind of say, I made a mistake, but I'm not dead. Right. You know, I'm not going to be defined by my worst thing. No. And I did that consciously. I don't know. And I had a whole attitude about this, right? You remember yeah. that I'm going to go back and, and I'm, I think part of me would probably say now I may just go put a place new and not have that fight. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, the, I can tell you, I got feedback the other day. I met a guy, guy that works with me with foster care kids we do. He said he was talking to a guy at Nativity, and he explained it to him what I was doing. And the guy said, yeah, but he did so many bad things. He's just trying to make up for it. Uh -huh. And I go, really? Yeah. Well, you, you know, know, Pete Carroll, uh, after he had that horrible call at the Super Bowl, I remember his Sports Illustrated interview, and he said, I'm not going to let those 10 seconds define me. I'm going to use it. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, that's one of the reasons I – felt like writing a book and doing a podcast. I, I feel like the experiences that we have, uh, you know, mistakes don't define you. They make you wiser. Um, and, you know, if you use your experience, whatever your experience is, you can 
benefit yourself and maybe somebody else. But I want to talk a little bit about what you're doing now, because I think it's really interesting how you're really doing something that um, makes a lot of sense and not a lot of people are talking about. So one of the th- I went to this thing called the Halftime Institute. It's in uh, Bob Buford's group in, in Texas, Catholic Charities page. So the idea is that the first half of your life is success. The second half is significance. So a lot of the people that go there, you know, have made all their money and trying to figure out what gets them going for the rest of their life as they retire. So one of the principles is called a small probe. That as you look at your life, you look at what gives you joy and happiness, probe things to look at where you could volunteer and help. So I was able to, two years ago, I got, I volunteered, got involved in foster care. And I began to really see these kids have, you know, they aren't born on third base for sure. And 40% of the kids that age out at the 18 go to prison. So I had some How much? Did you say 40%? Like 40%. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, so if I take a 17-year-old in foster care, I hung out with them when he was 25 and 30 at Leavenworth. I mean, right. there were a lot of that there. So I began to volunteer. Uh, we began, we did some work with teenage suicide prevention in four Catholic high schools. We found a health model. And about a year ago, after a bunch of different jobs I did, I decided to go full-time into foster care. We're doing two things. One, we have a foster care ranch in Lawrence where there's 20 boys that are in three group homes, and we work with them for a year on what's called a hope, health, and strength model. And some of it's what I learned at Leavenworth, and some of it learns teenage suicide prevention. So we're building that model with them to help those kids have a good life. And then the other thing we found, we're going to solve homelessness of foster care. So there's a program called Victory Lap out of Tennessee where kids that age out actually live in senior living communities. So we're right now, which is a great idea. I mean, I, I think that's yeah. an unbelievably great idea because these people that are older, like the young people and the young people being with the older people, they, that that's a natural community. Yeah. We've had, we've had 15 seniors involved with these foster care kids in the last year. So one of them, Sue, her husband passed away 90 days ago. And she said, you saved my life. Yeah. Another one, Sandy, who's 82, who's a second grade teacher. She reads to the boys every two weeks because nobody's ever read to them and gives them books. It's the reason I love it. Her up. I, I love that of this hope, health, and strength model called lighting you up. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is we'll take we'll get our first, there's 500 kids in Kansas that age out of foster care. We'll probably try to place 200 of them over the next year, and we'll take this model and we'll take it nationally. So what helps me? I'm not around my children right now, but I have a big father gene in me. It's one of the my favorite thing was called was called dad. Yeah. So I these kids aren't replacing my children, but I have a I get a lot out of being being a father to kids. So it helps me with that. It also makes me miss my kids even more, unfortunately, at times. Well, I tell you yeah. though, being a mentor though, Jim, and, and here's the other thing. I mean, what I think you're doing is so impactful, but for them knowing what you went through and that you are okay. And you can relate to them maybe in a different way that somebody else can't. Uh, there's something there to that. That's a good vibe. Well, there, let's just talk about strength. Yeah. Right. So if I'm a foster care kid, I've been through a lot. How'd you get through it? What'd you learn about yourself? So they asked me lots of questions about prison. They asked me why I'm not more screwed up. Right. I mean, they, they ask everything, but the reality of it is, they need, they are actually stronger than they think. And we build on that strength model with them. And they're all at high risk for suicide. The program called Source of Strength out of Utah that we use has never been applied to foster care. So, by the way, that same hope, health, and strength model, we have seniors right now that are at serious issue of mental health. I was just with the CEO today that we're going to do a model with them. So, the, the net of all this is it's my soul. It's I, I built the point where I'm proud of who I am. I'm not the same person. Um, I'm not saying I'm better because I wouldn't want to say I'd want to go through that again, but I'm using it. And so what, what I learned about my faith was it was something I did. It was a verb. And so what I'm trying to do with my soul and my own life is I'm trying to use what I've learned and apply it to something. And the work is extremely rewarding, uh, helping kids, but also helping seniors. Yeah. Um, and I think we're going to, I think we're going to have success because the agenda is really the agenda of solving something, not building something. If we solve, if we're able to solve 
homelessness of foster care kids, the, re- the, 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 the ripple effect, the tipping of all that will be tremendously important to so many aspects. Well, I mean, I, I, Jim, I think it's just uh, very admirable what you're doing. But I think, you know, the other part of that is, is that a lot of what success is, is are you making a difference? Right. And I just can tell by the way you're talking, you know, it's, it's, it's like the uh, Zay Wantaneo of Andy Dufresne and, and, and uh, Shawshank, he, he, you could see him light up, you know, it was the bluest of the Pacific, you know, it's the boat, you yeah. know, it's a fix. And what you're talking about now, it, it fills you up. And boy, I think that's, that's, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a lot younger than you, what, eight years, but man, I'm proud of, I'm proud of what you're doing and, and I'm proud that you're getting a lot out of it. And I think it's just fantastic. It really well, is. But I, I think the other thing people need to understand is you and I did prison differently. Yeah. Um, you went through prison and your family and the strength they exhibit. I mean, I, I have so many stories of snapshots of you and your kids and your, and, and Julie and what you've gone through. And, you know, your story is a story of strength of a family. Yeah. And I'm very jealous of that. And I'm also very respectful of that. I appreciate that. I think that if people can understand from your story that a family can flex their muscle, a family can go through the tough times and and really emerge, um, and that is such a that is such an inspirational thing to, to have people know. Families go through lots of stuff right now. There's lots yeah. of things going on. And one of the things you did, you were open and honest. You brought everybody together. You kind of you didn't play. There was no there was no parsing. Right. You, they all experienced it together with you, and are so much stronger. I mean, you guys, you know. You guys really flexed your muscles. So. Well, and I appreciate that. And I think that, you know, Jim, the there's a difference between victimhood and survivor. And I think you should always look at your situation and say, I'm a survivor in this. How do I, how, how do I get through it? And most of the time, even when dealing with prison, it's never as bad as you think it's going to be, strangely enough. And even, you know, and I, I, you know, on trying to help people with this podcast, the biggest thing when we build prisons in our mind because of whatever we've had experiences in our life, you know, the thing is, is, is mostly what it is, is that everybody's afraid to step into what they're unsure of, what they're afraid of, whatever their nightmare is. But if you step and take action into it, attempt to make a difference, uh, you'll get to where you want to be. And it won't be as hard as you think. It's, it's the taking the action that I think is what people – have to uh, grit themselves to. Well, so many people are stuck. Yeah. I mean, there's, gen, you know, I got a lot of kids in their 20s and early 30s that came out of college and COVID. All this, they're stuck. You know, there's generational kids are trying to figure out faith but aren't accepting mom and dad's faith the same way they experience faith. People, whether it be video games or social media, we saw when we did the teenage suicide stuff, you know, Rockers High School that year had three suicides. Um, so, but, 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 if at the end of the day, when you sit down and you say, you know, what, this is my life. Right. This is my faith. Yeah. What am I doing? Right. And, 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 and realize that you make all the difference how you think about it. There's a, there's a concept in suicide prevention called framing. You know, how you frame something changes your attitude to it, right? Yeah. So if you and I framed it, well, a lot of guys we saw coming out of prison would come out and say, like I've been screwed by the government yeah. or let the man win. We didn't frame it that way. Yeah. And, and you got to watch your assumptions. If you're in your twenties right now or in your thirties and you're trying to figure out your career, are you self-aware? Do you know yourself? What do you have a mentor? Do you have people around you to give you advice? Are you arrogant? Are you, I mean, yeah. Brett and I in our thirties, we could do no wrong. Right. Um, and what has to happen when you go to prison, you, your life runs into a wall. And that's life. Yeah. But so it, so it happens also when you get cancer. When you, right. you're not, this isn't that unique. What's unique about it, I think, especially in a prison situation, is the fact that this thing, this thing stays with you, something that we can never overcome because it's that, it's that stamp that you know that society has on us. So. Well, and I think the other thing, the, the it, whether you 
everybody's got their own situation that they deal with and it's all relative to what they have experienced and life is unfair the unfair things happen in life but can you pick yourself into making a difference regardless and and right. that's where you find that satisfaction of whatever you're looking for it you know regardless of what's going on can you still make a difference to pick yourself up and it's like you said Jim it's mindset it's mindset. It's uh, my favorite, you know, the Henry Ford quote is uh, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. Right. And my favorite quote is Albert Einstein. Life is like a bicycle. You need to keep moving to keep balance. Love that. And I think just if you're stuck, get moving. Get I don't moving. Care what you're moving on. Get moving. Get moving. Yeah. Jim. Thanks so much, man. You you meant so much to me uh, when I needed help, and and uh, it's been a great talk. I appreciate it. Thank you, Brent Cassidy. So everybody, nightmare success in and out. Thanks for being here today.